if folks have have seats empty seats in their row if they could maybe hold up some hands we'd love to get this uh we'd love to get the theater full before we start moving over into overflow seating so just a couple more minutes and then we'll we'll get going I think there's I think there's two seats up there. Where are you pointing? So like four down from the top. Yep, like Yeah. Okay, well, welcome everybody. My name is Jennifer Jubinville. I'm the store manager of the bookstore at Fitgers, and I'm really, really proud to welcome you to Fitgers, um, historic building, um, beautiful spirit of the North Theater. The building is 142 years old, so there are a few little quirks, and one of the quirks is that there aren't restrooms on this floor. Um, if you do need a restroom, they're down on second floor, or you can take the elevator down to first floor. So. Um, but we love our beautiful historic building and we thank you for coming out tonight and enjoying it. Um, if things do get warm, another thing with the historic buildings is sometimes it can be hard to control the heat. If things get warm, we do have a lot of seats available in the overflow seating and that room um, is staying a lot cooler. So um, everybody that is here tonight we'll get a chance to hear Kara. We're live streaming the event into the overflow seating room. Um, I do just wanna emphasize the fact that um, we're not allowing outside books or outside things to be signed. And the reason for that is because we want you to buy the books from us um, since we're the ones that are putting on the event. And so we hope that you understand with that. Um, but just please remember when you do buy your books from an independent bookstore, one of the things you get to do is you get to support us and tell us that you want us to bring authors here like Kara um, and other authors. So um, Jeff Bezos and his crew at the website whose name we don't say in our building, um, they don't put on events like this tonight. So um, please remember that when you choose where to spend your money. That besides the fact that 67% of every dollar you spend 
at an independently owned business stays local. So that's my little commercial, my little soapbox. Um, we are absolutely thrilled um, to be here and to be hosting Kara. Um, and we just, she, we were thinking of reaching out to her and she reached out to us before we could reach out to her. So um, we're thrilled about the book. Um, I have read it. It is absolutely breathtaking and tells a ton of information. There will be an opportunity to ask questions. Um, but what I'm going to do, because no one wants to be listening to me talk, I'm going to introduce um, Brett Jensen from the University of Minnesota Duluth track team and Charla Buxbaum um, from the University of Minnesota Athletic, Duluth Athletic Department um, and Kara. And they will be moderating the event tonight. And then afterwards, um, you'll get to see me um, for audience question and answers, and then afterwards we'll move into the August Fitger room for the actual book signing. So um, again, thank you very much for being here. Oh, one other quick thing, if you could please turn your cell phones off and we are not allowing recording of, of this evening. Um, so, but that's that, okay. See, I should have had notes. Okay, we'll, we'll bring Brett and Charla and Kara up, so thank you. Oh my gosh, hi. Um, my name is Charlotte Buxbaum. I'm currently in my 11th year at the University of Minnesota Duluth. I am the Assistant Director of Sports Medicine and Performance, um, primarily working with a, various teams, but as well as men's and women's cross country and track and field. Um, full disclosure, two quick things. Now, once, not ever, um, did I think that I would moderate an author talk, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to preface the whole night with just that. And then additionally, um, in 2018, I married into a, a super, super family. And on that day, I got a sister-in-law named Kara Goucher. So um, Brett, she's going to know all the PRs from Kara's eighth grade on. Every race, everything. Me, you can find me in the bar afterward telling embarrassing stories about Kara and how quirky and uh, wonderful she is outside of running. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Charla. Now I have to follow that introduction up. So <laughs> uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Brett Jensen. I'm the head men's and women's cross country coach at the University of Minnesota Duluth. I'm also one of the assistant coaches and get the fine pleasure to coach um, some really great 18 to 23 year olds. Um, they're just kind of the, the highlight of my day and uh, make my job super fun. And I, I love running. And, you know, with, with that, Kara has been a longtime hero of mine and talk about just kind of full circle. Never did I think either that I would be um, had an author talk and having this opportunity to discuss, um, you know, one of, my, one of my role models for life and um, just feel really honored to be here. So thank you for, for joining. All right, Duluth, it's time. Please help me welcome two-time Olympian, New York Times best-selling author of a recent memoir, The Longest Race, Inside the Secret World of Abuse, Doping, and Deception on Nike's Elite Running Team, Kara Goucher. Kara, it's our greatest pleasure um, to welcome you back to your home, to Duluth. Um, you know, one of the best female American distance runners of all time. Like I introduced to the audience, one of my greatest inspirations in running and getting into the sport. And being able to watch you in Osaka while I was a seventh grader back at home was, was kind of, you know, my, my entry level into, into running and, and just... Now I'm here. Um, you know, we, we really want to thank you uh, for, for coming back to, to your home and taking time out of your busy schedule to, to be here with us. Um, so tonight's all about you and your incredible courage um, and in your journey through your ups and downs of your career. Um, so why don't we start off right off the bat? Why don't you tell us, why, why did you write this book, this memoir? 
Um, I think there was a lot of misinformation about my career and about the team that I was in and what my husband and I dealt with. And for years, I would see these people write articles about my life that I had never met, that I had never trained with. And it would drive me crazy. There's my husband. It would drive us crazy, actually. Um, and, but I also felt like I had to keep quiet at that time. I was fighting battles with, you know, I was testifying against my former coach in the USADA hearings and things like that. So I felt like I just had to stay quiet. But I finally got to a point where I just was like, this was my opportunity to tell my story from me. And um, I thought about it for a couple of years, and then I finally really went for it. In 2019, I started meeting with potential co-authors and uh, Mary Pollan, my co-author, there would be no book without Mary. We just really connected and then we looked for a publisher and we got a deal pretty quick and that's how it came to be. Um, I think uh, just from reading the book, we talk, you, you talk, not me, um, about the inspiration that is Papa. And I just, can we just like hear a little bit? I know, you know, Papa got you into running, but you know, just overall his influence in your entire career from being six to 36. Yeah, he, he always believed in us girls. My mom's, I mean, he believed in all of his grandchildren, but I think we had a special bond because we, you know, our father died when we were little. And he just believed in all of us. And he was at every single race I ran. You know, he was like telling me splits that I could run. Um, I think there was a story of like at the state meet, I went out really hard and someone said I was going to die and he like argued with the people in the stands like, no, she's not going to die. She's going to win, you know. Um, but he was just a champion, you know, even when I would struggle with running, he was always so supportive and he just, you know, he was so much more than a person who got me into running. You know, he like really helped me see that I could be more than I thought and he was always there for me and, you know, I miss him terribly. If I'm being honest. And I, I think I recall from the book too, um, there was a particular story about your first race in getting into running and, um, you know, back in Hermantown, um, right here in Duluth or in, in the community. And, you know, would you tell us more about kind of how, you know, Papa was able to see that competitiveness in you? Yeah, I mean, I believe it or not, I'm actually really shy. Um, and my grandpa took me to this race, and I fell at the beginning. He thought, like, oh, great, you know, she's, and I, like, my knees were bloody, and he thought I was going to, like, be upset and cry. And I totally caught him off guard by, like, jumping up and being like, they're getting away from us. And that's when he first saw that little competitive streak, which I, honestly, I didn't really even know that I had. Um, but he never made me, you know, I was competitive. You can ask my sisters or my step-siblings. No one wanted to play games with me because I take it way too far. My husband and I cannot play games together. It's just off the table. Um, and so it was in there, but he never made me feel like that was something to be ashamed of. You know, that was something that he helped nurture. Like, you can do these things. You should set these goals. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, you know, it, it really, just throughout the, the first part of the, the memoir, you know, it, it really seemed like he filled a big hole um, that had been created, you know, with the... Um, the, the passing of your father and, and that, that tragedy um, on your family. Can you talk a little bit more about, you know, his, you know, through the years, through that, after, you know, that, that tragedy of, of your father passing away? Yeah, he was just always there for us. You know, he, it's interesting, he actually got my mom to run during her grief process as well. And he, he just was always there. You know, I have a bunch of messages on my phone, which I can just never delete of him being like, hey, Kara, it's your grandpa calling. I know you're busy, you know, um, but he was just, he was just like, I knew he'd always be there. Whether I messed up or I did right, you know, he was never going to leave my side. And he just was such a, I always feel bad because my grandma gets like totally shafted because she was amazing as well. Uh, like she was awesome and she was super funny, but he just was like kind of our pillar. We all call him our North Star and he really was our North Star. Incredible. So kind of fast forward a few years as you grow you know, older, you're at the Duluth East High School and, and kind of the star of the state, you and Carrie Tollefson. And, um, I mean, as far as running, I was like not that popular <laughs> in school, but yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, but then, you know, you, you, shine, you, you, know you, were, you were the star right away um, early on in your career as, 
you know, a freshman. And then, you know, as sometimes all of us runners can relate and experience, um, you, you had great lows as well. Um, you know, you, t you talked about how you were really confident in your, in your early high school years. And then, you know, something was put in your head along the way that you didn't have the right look. I guess I should say look as, as a runner would. Um, can you kind of talk about that and um, how, how you were able to work through that as, as a, a, an adolescent and, how, um, and who helped you along the way? Yeah, I think, you know, running is a sport that kind of suffers from eating, eating disorders. And it's at all levels. It's at the youth level. It's at the high school level. It's collegiate level, professional level. And it's just sort of an unfortunate part of our sport that I would really love to see changed. But, you know, I think what's really hard for females that start early, like start running young, is that you, you haven't gone through puberty. And you're just like a little pocket rocket. The strength to power ratio is crazy. And so when you do go through puberty and your body changes, it's tough. Like, I remember feeling very clumsy and uncomfortable. You know, I went from like 5'2 to 5'8 in a pretty short period of time. And I was like, what is this body? And so, you know, I, I was very loved, but I didn't have anyone who was like, this body is the body that will take you somewhere. You know, that other body wouldn't be able to handle the training. And, and I didn't have that. But what I did have was an incredible group of teammates at East High School that were like, we're not going to starve ourselves. We're not going to be like that and really look out for each other. But I think I had gone to a national championship a couple of times. And I had, you know, you, you see it's modeled for you. And you see the girls that are doing well. And I think it's a problem for our sport. And I think it needs to be addressed much earlier on. Yeah, and, and kind of building off of that, you know, you, you talk about your teammates and having your younger sister uh, as an eighth grader be on, on the varsity team as well and, and kind of going through that change. And, I, you know, something that I really liked, you know, about the, the story early on was having the three-peat of um, the high school, the high school cr state cross-country championships and voicing your change for to, to have that assembly to, um, you know, because the, the men's hockey team got it every year, you know. Was that something that, you know, you and your teammates, how, 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 did you, how did you create that kind of culture? You know, I think that that is what everyone wants at, as a team. I, I think it was our, co our coach, Dick Skog. Everyone mattered. You know, everybody on the team mattered. It didn't matter if you were scoring varsity athlete or if you were literally finishing dead last. He, everybody mattered. And I think I am thankful to that because I think when I started to struggle with my running, it, I, I still had to show up for my teammates. They still mattered. We were in this together. And so I think I really owe a lot of my love for the sport and being able to love it through tough times to Dick Skog, for sure. As far as like the assembly thing, I just got mad. You know, I was like, we're very successful. We won state three times in a row and we don't get a welcome home. And this is nothing against the hockey team, but they won once and, you know, they got this huge welcome home assembly and so that was just like the beginning of you know like again I can be shy but I also like get underestimated a lot I think and that was the beginning of like that's not fair so I'm going to say something about it and so yes now they all get welcome home assemblies if they want <laughs> so speaking of like dicks go kind of fast forwarding a, a bit more too it's when I'm reading the book I am feeling like you kind of had a little bit of blind faith like Mark Wetmore wasn't the one who recruited you. Yeah. The offers were kind of drying up at the, you know, at the end of high school. Mark had only coached the men. And, and also, I mean, I know you had heard of Alberto, but it, the Nike Oregon Project in itself was, was new. Like, it, feel, it felt to me that you had this, like, faith to just be like, or, like, this gut feeling, like, this is right. But, like, talk to us about how you kind of came to those decisions or, like, who's guiding you or, like, what made you feel that that was right for you. Yeah, I mean, I definitely was green, right, or naive a little bit. But I kind of like that about myself, too. Like, I, I have become a little bit more jaded as I've gotten older, and I don't like that. Like, when I got the job at NBC, I was like, all the men are going to be rude to me. All the men are going to talk down to me. And then they're, like, really amazing people. So I'd like to be a little bit more like I was when I was younger. But um, I just wasn't running very well my senior year of high school. I was really struggling. And, yeah, there's a story in there where my little sister is, like, running behind me, and I'm like, pfft just pass me. Um, but, I, but I think because of the love I had for this sport, I wanted to continue. So I had gone on a few recruiting visits, but I wasn't really in love with anything. And um, my mom had taken me and my stepdad had taken me to see the NCAA cross country meet. 
and I saw this team, Colorado. They were kind of like a ragtag team, the women's team. They didn't have like any individual stars, but they got second. And this is like way before, like I couldn't email anyone, so I don't even know how my mom like tracked down these numbers. And I left a, I left a message like in the middle of the night when I wouldn't be, I knew no one would be there. And I'd be like, my name's Kara Wheeler, and I went to Foot Locker twice, and I'm a state champion, and I'm not running very well right now, but I think I could help your team. And like, like literally, I sold myself. And um, I did end up getting, you know, was able to go to Colorado on a recruiting visit, but Mark Wetmore was only the men's coach. Um, there was a woman named Toby Jacober, and that seemed really appealing to me to be coached by a woman. I had never been coached by a woman. So anyway, I signed with Colorado for a 20% scholarship, and then, I don't know, maybe a few weeks before I was supposed to report in the fall, she's like, hey, so I quit. Um, I can't get along with Mark Wetmore, but he's taking over the team, and it'll be great, you know? And so I went in pretty scared, if I'm being honest. But then we ended up having a great relationship. And so, you know, Mark really kind of put me back together as, like, I say to him, to his face. Like, I was kind of this washed-up high school star, and you helped me put those pieces back together. And um, he helped me end up winning three individual national collegiate titles, and we did win a national title as a team. And then after that, you know, I, st I was just struggling again. And part of the problem was that... Mark was coaching Adam and I, but Mark's a collegiate coach, and that's where his focus had to be, and we just were, we were struggling, we were young, we didn't have kids yet, and we thought, well, we could go anywhere. And so we visited a few different programs, but when we saw the Nike Oregon Project, it felt like we'd be foolish to turn this down, you know? I mean, yeah, I was gonna be the only woman, but we were gonna have access to this amazing facility, to the best coaching in the world, by the biggest sportswear brand in the world. It just seemed like, these opportunities don't come around very often. So it seemed like a no-brainer to go. So I trusted, we trusted our gut and maybe, yeah. you know. Did, did you feel a little blinded by like the glam of Nike or? Yeah, I mean, we, we're there and they're like, oh, we'll go by the employee store and here's $2,000 to spend there. And oh, we'll take you, you know, like it's, it, if you're an athlete and you, and plus like, th I mean, it's still the same, but I just, anything, any Nike ad just doesn't penetrate me anymore. Um, but like I grew up wanting, I mean, I remember I'd go into Austin Jaro and be like, I want the Nike Air Max. And Jaro would be like, well, I'm not sure that that's the right shoe for you. I'd be like, I can't hear you. That's the one I want, you know? And so when you get, when I signed with Nike right out of college and then three years later when we got invited to join this team, it felt like, I mean, I'm one of the cool kids now, you know? Yeah. I've never been one before, really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that actually, that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, so you know, um, you know, going forward to 2004, you you and Adam decide to join the the Nike Oregon project. You know, the the latest and greatest, the cutting edge technology. Um, you know, and, and this coach Alberto Salazar. Um, you know, one of the the greatest marathoners in the in the early 70s. Um, you know, but right away there were some red flags, and and you know, it, that that was kind of the theme of the book here is there red flag after red flag and. Um, you know, what, can, can you talk through some of those things that, you know, stuck out and that, but you were still able to kind of persevere through, you know, being, being gaslit and, and sabotaged on, on the daily and leading into, you know, the future to the night before races, trying to really, you know, throw you off is what it seemed like. Yeah, I think when we first got there, you know, we were just so happy to be there. We, Adam and I had both been injured off and on for years. We were struggling. It was like a, it was a chance at like a rebirth of our careers. And I got injured right away and ended up having another surgery. But Adam pretty quickly started to turn his results around. And um, it just, you know, at first it was just sort of like little things like NCAA violations. Well, they don't matter, you know. Um, so it was just little things. And it really wasn't until you know, I had been there over a year before we started to see anything that seemed uncomfortable. But again, it's like, this is the, the best team in the world. This is the most funded team in the world. This is one of the best runners in the world ever. Like, if, this, if there's something wrong, someone would put an end to it. And I think one thing that people have to understand too is like, you, this is your dream. Like, you're, you're sacrificing having a family, spending time with your family, all these things to make this dream happen. And when you can start to see it come into focus, it's really easy to say, well, Mark Wetmore wasn't perfect either, and Dick Skog was a little bit crazy, and, you know, you just, like, make up these excuses and push, push those things aside. Honestly, it wasn't until 
we decided to leave and I started talking it through with people that I realized just how many red flags there were. But in the moment, it just seemed like small, small, small. Um, so as you're, you know, kind of transitioning out of leaving the Oregon project, but, but the whole time too, like you called Mary Kane, like you were losing sleep, you were stressed about what was going on with Amy Yoder Bagley, you know, um, how come you didn't give yourself that grace? How come, how come you were so concerned about everyone else, but how did you manage to get up every day and keep putting yourself through it? While I was still on the team? Yeah, when you were, st when you were these red flags were occurring and like, but like you knew, like you cared for Amy, but like how come, but you were still going through some of the same abuse too. Like how come, how did you not just be like, reach inside yourself and be like, this is, I'm done. I think because I'm a little bit vulnerable with um, um, a father-ish figure, and I felt I felt like he was I, he was supposed to be in my life, and I just have to deal with the things that aren't make me uncomfortable. I'll, and if I just laugh them off, it'll go away quicker. And I think that I was so convinced, you know, like it almost ruined my marriage. But I was so convinced that I couldn't perform well without him. Like he was the one that had brought me back. And he was the one who had helped me win the medal. And he was the one who helped me land on the podium. And I'm so close to achieving everything I ever wanted. And it's all because of him. That's how I felt. And also, our relationship, now I'm horrified by it. But at the time, it was more than just a coach-athlete relationship. And we would share things about our, you know, my doubts and all of these things, my pain from childhood or whatever. And it also felt like if I left, I'd be losing Way, way more than a coach. Right. And so I just had to put it aside. I just couldn't, I couldn't even like go there. It was just like, that's, that's who Alberto is. No one's perfect. And I, and, but I need him. And you had gone through losing your father already. Yeah. Um, not to mention your psychologist was. Was actually not a psychologist. Not a psychologist. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and there was like no safe space for you. It felt, it just No, was like there was nowhere to go. Yeah. No, I mean. There's no other women. Finally, Amy joins, but we're not always on the same program. We were in 08 leading up to the Olympics, but other than that, then I moved to the marathon. She, was, she stayed on the track. So there's a lot of time being alone. We have this psychologist who we were told was a sports psychologist, who now I know was, has a doctorate in kinesiology. Like, that's not the same thing, it turns out. Um, but like, I have to talk to him to stay on the team. I, I am a person who likes to talk through things. I, like, I actually love therapy, so like even though it was weird it was like at least it was a place for me to like express stuff but then it's coming back to me through Alberto it's just like well who do I go to there they're connected at the hip I can't you know I mean Darren became so powerful that we would go to the start line and Alberto wouldn't be the last person that talked to me Darren would and so I, like it's like well where do I go from there I don't I don't know anyone in HR I don't know a single female in any position of power at Nike so that's the thing like looking back I, I didn't even consider it because where would I go? Plus, Phil Knight and Alberto are besties, you know? Like, what am I going to do? I go all the way to the top. I'm disposable. They're not. Yeah. It is annoying. It is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, kind of going through to, um, you know, your first, winning, winning your first medal um, at, at the World Championships in Osaka in 2007, Despite it all, despite it all, by that time, you know, you were sexually assaulted. And, you know, at, at, at that moment in Osaka, you, you prevailed and you ran the race of your life. Can you just describe that feeling there in, in Osaka, the, the, you know, when it, getting the bronze and now recently upgraded to silver? Um, and just, just what, what, what did it take? I, you know, I think about my career and I think about the times where it was just like purely joyful. And that was definitely one of those moments. We were, we were going over to the, you know, Alberto had had a heart attack that summer and he almost died. And it really affected me. It felt, I felt like, well, I can push through any pain because Alberto almost died. And then that night when we were heading over to the meet, Adam was like, well, you need to bring your medal out stand outfit. And I was like, what? I'm like, I don't remember what I was ranked, but only ahead of a few people by time. And he was like, no, 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 you're going to do so great. And I was like, I don't have room for it. And he put it, my metal stand up in his backpack. Um, 
I think I just was like in that moment filled with like gratitude. Like when I raced, I was feeling gratitude and I just felt like I can't lose, you know? And I mean, the, the, the plan that Darren and Adam and Alberto and I talked about on the way to the track was stay in the top five as long as you can because you, we know you're in really good shape and we know you're in shape that people don't realize you're in. So you could run in 10th and 15th and kick your way up into 8th, or you could take a risk. Because if you falter, everyone's ex going to expect it anyway, right? Like, no one's expecting you to do anything. And I really committed to that race plan. I really committed to, like, I'm going to match every move until I physically just can't anymore. And as the race unfolded, I, I, like, every lap that, it's a 25-lap race, and every lap that went by when I still was, like, in the lead pack, I was like, what's happening, you know? Um, and of course, we hear the bell lap, and I'm in fourth. And I remember thinking, I hope my mom is watching this because I'm about to get fourth in the world, you know. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, I can't believe this is happening. But then, you know, right on that backstretch, I started to think, some like I'm right behind Joe Pavey. Like I'm not like behind her. I'm on her. And I was thinking, one of our lives is going to change forever. One of us is going home with a medal. And I just remember thinking, I'm going to go with with a half a lap to go. And if she fights me, who cares? I'm going to be fourth in the world. And she did not fight me at all. It was like she, she just caved, kind of. I mean, I like Joe a lot, so I feel bad saying that, but it's true. And, yeah, I think when I crossed that finish line, that was the most joyful, pure experience of probably my professional career because it was so unexpected. I mean, I was going crazy. I was, like, knocking people over. I was, like, holding the flag backwards because I had never held a flag before. Um, <laughs> But it was just, it really was just like pure joy in that moment. Yeah, and, and for, for those of you that don't know, maybe don't know, or maybe haven't read the book yet, you did finish third in that, in yeah. that race. And um, recently upgraded to silver due to, um, you know, drug violation of the second place finisher. Yeah. Um, can you describe that, that feeling? You know, something I've just always admired about you is your advocacy for clean sports. And you know, just how, how did it feel to get that medal years later? How many years later? Um, I got, well, I stood on the podium 10 years later, but I didn't get the medal until 12 years later uh, or two years after that. You know, I remember that. So we, what happens is you get drug tested at the world championships if you're in the top five and then a few random people. And there's a 10-year statute of limitations. So once 10 years goes by, even if they somehow find your old sample and test it and it's positive, too bad. So they've started doing this retesting process at the eight-year mark. And so they had retested our samples. And I, Adam was actually running Trans Rockies, this race like across the Rocky Mountains. And I was just like eating M&Ms, like Cole was in bed. And I get this text message from Chris Chavez, who was working for Sports Illustrated at the time. And he was like, congratulations on the silver. I was like, what? What silver, you know? And he was like, you're, you're getting moved up. Evelyn Applegasse's resample was po positive for stands and all, I think. I was like, what? And, but she fought it, and so I didn't really know what was happening. And literally, what was it, like three weeks before the World Championships in 2017, I get this call saying, it's official, you're the silver medalist, and if you can get yourself to London, you can stand on the podium. And, and I was like, well, can you get me to London? <laughs> like, I'm not the one that did something wrong, you know? And they were like, well, we can get you there, you can stay in a hotel for two nights. And I was like, and my husband and my child, you know? So they did eventually pay for all three of us to go. Um, but it was very surreal because Joe and I got our, med well, like we got our like fake little medals, but she had two children. I had a child. So much had changed in 10 years. Um, but I was really emotional. I don't know why. I just felt, you know, we had the medal ceremony and then right after that was the women's 10,000. And it made me feel sad. I was like watching these women and their lives changing by winning medals. and. My life did change. I got paid a lot more. I got a lot more opportunity. But Joe got dropped after that world championship. And her life could have been so different. And so I just had so many mixed emotions about it. Like, yes, it's good to right the wrong. But a decade later is way too late. And, and then for myself, I would, every time I would talk about Osaka, it's like Des Linden when she would talk about Boston. Like, we've talked about this. I'd always be like, well, I was lucky. It was hot, and the favorites faltered. But maybe if I had just been two seconds behind the world champion, like two seconds away from being world champion, maybe I would have believed in myself a little bit more. And so it, when I would say that to people, they'd go, but what is it? Like, it, it is a mental shift from thinking I'm lucky and I'm scrappy, and I clean up when people make mistakes versus 
I am one of the best in the world. And so I feel a little sad about it. I don't know, I have a lot of mixed emotions about it. And then it took forever to get the medal. I literally was tweeting at the president of the IAAF going, it's been 12 years, sure would be great if I could have a medal to hang around my neck, you know? So I finally got it during COVID. So I have it. It was very anticlimactic though. <laughs> okay. Um, Osaka, you're like at the peak of your career. Um, you've achieved your ch childhood dream. You've, you've made the 2008 Beijing Olympics. Knowing how you are with your family and your sisters, um, you're a bit of like a homebody. Like you guys yeah. are like obsessed with one another. Um, a little bit. We love each other. Yep. Yeah, it's totally healthy. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> like Alberto isolated you. Yeah. And... How did you overcome those moments of silence when the last thing you want to be doing before a race is actually probably just like laughing and joking with your family? And, um, or was it just this thing where like he was like, this is who it is, you're the, this is, if you want to be successful, this is how it is. And like, it was just one of those things that you just like bought into. It was a little of both. He believed in no distractions. I remember the first time I ran the Boston Marathon, it was like allowed a 30 minute time with my family two days before. And I remember Darren texting me and being like, you need to go back to your room. And I like, was trying not to cry, which is so crazy. But I also, again, at this point, I'm still, I still believe Alberto is the person who got me here. If he says I have to turn on my cell phone, I'll turn on my cell phone. If he says I can't talk to my family, I won't talk to my family. But I hated it. I hated it the whole time. But I also was like, well, I mean, I'm, I'm running well. I'm having success. So maybe eliminating distractions is good for me. Um, but I, I hated it. And that was one great thing when Colt was born. It was, it was like my mom or my sister or both of them would come and we would try to have adjoining rooms so I could like see my child that I birthed. And then he couldn't take that away, you know, but that was at the very end of my time with him. But, um, yeah, that was really hard for me. I yeah. hated the isolation. It, it doesn't sound like you at all. No. Um, you know, Oh, I lost my spot. Oh, so around 2007, 2008, we're running very, very well. Um, best, you know, what, your best running times under Alberto. What do you have to say to the critics who accusing you of doping at the time? Yeah, it's totally fair. I have a lot of thoughts on this, so I'm going to lay them all out. <laughs> Give it to us. One is that I was in my early 30s, which is the prime time for a female athlete. The second one is that after I had my son, I was forced to come back to practice right away and I never fully recovered from that. And it is not your fault, <laughs> but I never fully recovered. I have chronic, I mean, you, if you do an MRI, you can see I have chronic hip issues and stuff and pelvic issues because I was you know, running a week after I gave birth. And so I never could really, I, could, I had such a hard time staying healthy, and actually I do believe that the fittest I ever was in my life was in 2016, when I was 37 years old. I had finally put a year of training without injury behind me, um, and it just didn't work out on that day. But the other thing I will say too is, it's hard to come forward when you see something because everything you've worked for is gonna be doubted and denied. I had someone who I considered a friend say I should turn in my medal when I went public about what Alberto said and he's very big in the running world. And that'll keep you silent. I don't, I mean, some of my teammates, they saw stuff, but they won't say it because they, they don't want everyone to question what they did. I, I had to, Adam and I together had to decide, is it worth it? to have people always question what we accomplished in order to do the right thing? Or should we just be quiet and like preserve our, preserve our reputation but know that we could have done something to change it? And that's like a really hard place to be but obviously we chose the latter or the whatever, the right one. Um, and also, you know, like when I was with USADA, I said, I want you to look at all of our, we said, we want you to look at all of our blood work and there were, there were, um, you know, we were being tested all the time and there was things that Nike wouldn't hand over, there was things that Dr. Brown wouldn't hand over and we went and got those because we, we, had nothing to, we had nothing to hide and if we found out that something had happened, that was also something I needed to know because then I would give back my medal. But it was all good. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> Never tested positive. Yeah. No. Yeah. And, you know, something that, that really stuck with me as a new mother myself, just the having to go back into running a week after you give birth while Nike is profiting off of your image during pregnancy and also not paying you and you getting the, the reductions and um, just going through all of that. Can you, can you kind of take our, our audience here through what, what that was like and what those, those stipulations were? Yeah, like talk about gaslighting. Everyone was telling me I was crazy for thinking I deserved to be paid. But, you know, we were very, I always wanted to be a mom. I didn't want to wait until my career was over. I thought I could do both, which we see is possible with a lot of women now. And Adam and I talked very openly with our coach about when to have a baby, when to do it, what's the right time. And so no one was caught off guard, you know, by this whole situation. And at the time, I said, there, is no, there was nothing about pregnancy in, in Nike contracts at the time. And I remember my husband asked my coach, what's going to happen? My coach asked the head of sports marketing, John Capriati, and he said, don't even go there. As long as Kara asks us, as long as she does what we ask her to do and she stays relevant, nothing will happen. And so I made so many appearances during that time, so many photo shoots. I mean, I remember being on a cliff in L.A. and having morning sickness and just being like, just got to push through, you know. Um, and Nike actually orchestrated the announcement of my pregnancy. They told me not to put it anywhere, don't tell anyone, don't have your family tell anyone. And it was announced on the front page of the New York Times sports section on Mother's Day. So all hands are on deck saying this is like an amazing thing. And then I just stopped getting paid just out of nowhere. I, was, I wasn't even notified that I wasn't getting paid. Um, my financial, our financial advisor called and was like, your payment hasn't come through. And I was like, oh, pff, it's European track season. I wouldn't worry about it. Cap just hasn't had time to sign off on it. And then it turned out that, no, you're being suspended and we don't know for how long because you haven't been racing. And it, I was so caught off guard because I believed I was going to be a Nike lifer. Like, I'm going to work here. Like, I'm going to transition out of running. I'm going to get a job. I'm going to design super cute clothes. I'm going to be here forever, you know. And it really shook, like, my faith in the company. And Adam and I would meet with people. And I felt like I was just, gaslighting is the perfect word. Because everyone I would talk to, I mean, women I would talk to would be like, that is really effed up. But everyone at Nike would be like, yeah, but you didn't race. And that's what you're actually paid to do. And... You know, someone at that time had told Adam that I was the most requested female athlete at Nike across any sports for media. So there's some value there. But yeah, I wasn't getting paid during that time. And I was basically told, you need to stop the clock. There's been this clock you haven't raced since World Championships, and you need to get back out there and stop the clock. And so, yeah, a week after giving birth, I started running again. Yeah, and then, you know, after all of that, you decide you've had enough. You know, you've, you're, you're leaving that brand. And then comes Wazelle. Oh, yeah. Then comes Wazelle. Um, and they are reluctant to give you an offer, right? Because Yeah, they, they just said, no, we can't afford you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you're, you said, you, you rebuttaled with, no, name me your name, na give me something. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, basically I was like, I'm not, I'm done. I'm walking away from Nike. I don't care if they hold, say they have the right to hold you to 180 days. They have the right to do all these things. And I was like, I don't care what it takes. I'm not going back. And um, we started talking with other companies and it was really interesting. Like I, this company came to Colorado. We had a, a business meeting in Denver and they're giving me this pitch. Are you ready to be the face of the brand? Um, are you ready for women empowerment? No women there, just me, you know, being pitched this deck. And I'm thinking, like, how does nobody get this? How can you tell me you want to empower women? You don't have a single woman in sports marketing. So anyway, I had visited Wazel, and I fell in love with Sally, the, the founder. I just felt like she got me. She understood me. It was a little embarrassing, though, because she asked me, what are you passionate about? And I was like, well, what's Wazel passionate about? And she's like, well we have our things, but like, what's, what do you want people to know? And I was like, I don't know, what do you want people to know? And I remember going, that was so embarrassing. I'm in my 30s, and I don't even know what I stand for. But that intrigued me, like, that she wanted to know more about me than just a performing athlete. And I, one of the saddest days was when she called me and told me she wasn't going to make me an offer, that they couldn't afford me, and that they'd always be fans. And I felt so sad. So Adam was 
was working as my agent at the time, and he had secured a pretty good deal from a shoe company. And I remember him just being like, I know you don't want to sign it. And I was like, I don't. So he was the one that called Sally and was like, make us any offer, anything. And she was like, well, give me a couple days. And she came back with $20,000. I had been making 325 base, $20,000. And I was like, I'll take it. I'll do it. Their, their passion and their, just the advocacy that they have for women obviously left and, and still does for, for all of us here today that, that know the brand and, and love Wazelle. Um, you know, so, so at that time then, too, you're kind of going through um, you know, the, the arbitration and, and you know, getting through what was dealing with Alberto and, and the, the doping allegations and ultimately whistleblowing on, on all, all that you and Adam had been through. Um, how did you manage your time with, you know, th those allegations and the USADA process, which isn't easy, come to find out it's not easy. Yeah, I think the, the first time we went to USADA was February 2013, and he wasn't banned until, I wanna say October 2019. So it was a very long process, and I, I, that's one thing that like, it, it affected me. It was exhausting. And it, it, you know, it, like we wouldn't hear from them for a while, and then we would, and then um, obviously as we prepped for the hearings, it got really intense. They would come to Boulder and we would prep. And it, it was just very exhausting. I think, I, I don't regret at all that we went to USAD. I don't regret at all that we testified. But I do think it took a little bit of my career because it was just exhausting. And also at that time, I wasn't liked by everybody. I mean, I literally had meets telling me, like major marathons, telling me I wasn't welcome there. Um, so like actual opportunities for me to pursue the rest of my career were, you know, like literally race directors openly talking about me on forums, on message chat forums, um, and, and calling us a liars or that I want attention. So it really was very, very hard. And I think, I don't know what I thought was gonna happen, but like we went public in 2015 with this, well actually, the BBC and ProPublica were gonna do this story on Alberto and they had enough people they were gonna do it no matter what. And Adam was like, well, then I'll be a part of it. And I was like, don't do it. You know, I'm like, my career is still going on. I can't handle this. And so he filmed all, of, they flew from the UK. He filmed all these interviews. And then they came by the day they flew out to meet me and Colt and to like, let me know we're good people or whatever. And it just started to eat at me like, how can Adam go talk and I can't, you know? Like, what am I doing? You know, he shouldn't have to speak for me. He shouldn't have to defend me. So like, I don't know, four or five days later, I was like, just kidding, I will talk if you'll come back. <laughs> so they did, they rebooked and came back. When that aired, I don't know what I was expecting, but I wasn't expecting, I knew that some people would think that we were lying, but I wasn't expecting the nonstop personal attacks that like still continue. And I, I was not prepared for that at all. I was not prepared for that. Yeah, and, and now, you know, kind of flash forward from there, Alberto, during the, the 2019 World Championships in London, all of a sudden gets the, the, um, the ban, the, the, the multiple year ban um, from, from the sport. And, and then a couple years after that, he's banned for life. Um, and and from, from an anonymous, an anonymous um, you know, safe sport allegation, and come to find out, it's, it's from, from your experience with him as, as an athlete. Do you feel, are you, do, does that feel good to know that he can't ever be in track and field ever again? I feel good that other women are protected. What I don't feel good about is that I'm not the only victim. And I, that really makes me upset. And there's no acknowledgement for me or anybody else um, from him or from Nike. But I am very relieved. I mean, I didn't want to testify for Safe Sport. When they called, I, my teeth were chattering. I couldn't stop crying. I, you know, I, had, I didn't know. It, it sounds crazy, but I, I always believed that sexual assault was very violent, that you were fighting back. I, I thought that what happened between Alberto and I was just kind of gross. And so I had to sort of like re-examine my entire, like who I am and what has, you know? And so that was so hard and I was like, I'm not interested. I don't want to be a part of it. They kept calling and reaching back. No, thank you. 
Well, then when Mary Kane decided to come forward and to, she uh, went to Safe Sport as well. And then we knew that Amy and Mary were at least two people who were gonna be involved in this investigation. And they asked me if I would be a part of it. And I said, I don't know. I don't know, I have to think, I'm, I'm tired. I am tired of fighting. But it was the same sort of thing where I, I would think about, I would especially think about my nieces and how they're good girls being raised by a mom that grew up in Minnesota. You do what you're told, you're thankful, you don't make a mess. And I thought they could be in the same situation. It could happen to them. And that's really what made me feel like, okay, I'll do it. Um, and so there was an investigation that lasted a couple of years, and then he was banned for life. But then he, as he should, had a right to appeal it, and he did. And that experience was one of the worst experiences of my life, having to testify for hours upon hours for um, his lawyer constantly shaming me. You know, it just was a horrible, horrible experience. But in the end, it was worth it because now he cannot coach women at the elite Olympic level anymore. He can't coach anyone at the elite Olympic level. But he still could coach at high school or college or in another country. Um, I was listening to the interview that you just did the other day, um, and your first draft of the book was twice as long. <laughs> so, like, I don't know, give us a little nugget or something that we missed out in in the book. There were so many more little stories that apparently didn't add to the bigger story. Um, like, things that I thought were so important. Like, I fought to have, I don't know if you guys have read it, but I talk about how this boy told me I had a mustache in fifth grade. They tried to take that out, and I was like, this has to stay in. Um, but it was stuff like that, things I was self-conscious about, um, way more about all the activities that I did when I was younger. My dance teacher is here tonight. Stacy, are you here? Right there. I mean, I was in love with dancing. I, like, thought for a while, maybe, like, I'm going to be on Broadway or something, you know? Um, and so there was a lot about, like, dancing and soccer and what that had meant to me. And then there were just co stories in college and a lot of the youth stuff, basically. Basically, before I got to the Oregon Project, they were like, it doesn't matter, just tell us the basics. And, and that was hard um, because I felt like these little stories also helped tell who I am. But that's, that's why there's an editor, because he's like, no, no, you got to carve it down. People don't need to hear about your dolls, you know? <laughs> They don't need to hear about that stuff. You know, we got to get to the meat. What matters to the overall story? You, you and your dolls. You got one. I love dolls. <laughs> Not anymore. I mean, I would if someone would play with me, but. Uh, what really resonated with me the most, you know, is just you, you've obviously stuck to, stuck to your values. You've, you just have let your truth shine, you know, through all the ups and downs and, you know, last night at the, the DEC Athletic Hall of Fame induction and at your award acceptance speech being about being from northern Minnesota and talking about how, you know, when, when someone says, oh, you were so brave, we commend you for your bravery through all of these trials and tribulations. And you say, no, that's just who I am. Like, what, what is it about this community in Duluth and, and being from northern Minnesota that has helped shape you who you are today? I think it's, um, I mean, from a, like a really easy side, I got to see early how running could like bring people together, which is really cool. But I think, I mean, all my friends' parents were very hardworking, very honest people, loved the outdoors, did the right thing. My friend, you know, I'm sure there's a few turds in Duluth, but <laughs> in general, people really care about each other, people really care about the community, people really care about lifting each other up and doing the right thing. You know, like that is so ingrained in me from my mom, from my grandpa, but also from the people I grew up around. And so I don't feel brave. I actually feel like I'm kind of a chicken, but I can't, one thing about me is like, I just, I can't lie and I can't look away. And I feel like I got that from growing up in Northern Minnesota. I'm like, the biggest hardcore northern in Minnesota. Like, I, you guys should hire me, Duluth, for your advertising. <laughs> so I love it so much. I have Minnesota tattooed on my body. I feel like being from Minnesota defines me so much more than anything I ever accomplished at all. Like, that defines me so much more. And, and speaking about tattoos, I think recently you got the Olympic rings. Um, I did. That, that you reluctantly <laughs> didn't didn't want to get, but someone, a special guest here, was super, you know, 
wanting you to, to do that. Yeah, my son Colt, who's here and is dying right now, um, he started to say, like, Mom, you should get the Olympic rings. It's about a year ago, or maybe even more now. You know, we live in Boulder, where there are actually quite a few Olympians. And he would see it on other people, and he's like, Mom, you should do that. And I'd be like, I didn't run well. You know, I didn't, I don't remember the Olympics fondly. Um, but he kind of helped me start to see it differently. And he came home from school, I don't know, it was probably a couple months ago now, and he was like, Mom, it's a big deal. You should be proud. And something about the way he said it, I literally just went to the computer and emailed a random tattoo shop and was like, can you tattoo Olympic rings? And so I do have my Olympic rings now, thanks to Colt. And um, I don't know, it's, there's something about having a child and seeing it through their eyes. And, and, you know, that's how I used to be. Like, that makes me want to cry. I used to think going to the Olympics was like the ultimate. And somewhere along the way, I lost that. I felt like I failed, even though I had accomplished a dream I had had since I was really young. So... I love you, Colton, <laughs> and my tattoo. All right, so just definitely building on that right there, three-parter for you. Let's talk about your legacy. So, you're 44. Let's, let's revert. Thanks, Sharla. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. That's, you, anybody can Google that, it's yeah, fine. Right. True, true, true. Um, okay, take me back to 24-year-old Kara, okay? recently graduated, you're running professionally. At that point, what did 24-year-old Kara's legacy want to be? In the sport, I just wanted to make an Olympic team. That's okay. all I wanted. It's all... That's it. Just line. make an Olympic team. That's all I cared about. Okay, we transitioned 10 years. Got your silver medal, you're upgraded. Um, you're 34, you have a son. You've met these goals that you've had since 1992? 1992 was when I like promised myself I was gonna make the, the Olympic team. Yeah. Um, but like what, how did the legacy shift at that point from 24 to 34? I think after having Colt, I started to see things so much bigger than myself. And almost like it took me back to high school where it's not about me, you know? Like, so what if I make the Olympic team? What does that actually do? I mean, I am proud, don't get me wrong, but what does that actually do? I, I know all of these things are happening. It, it's interesting how I had such a hard time. You know, I'm married to Adam Goucher, who literally kicked someone off a track because he thought he was a doper, right? He has no problem saying what he thinks. He has no problem standing up for what he believes in. That's not my personality as much. And it's interesting to me that I had to have this baby and fighting for this baby to be taken care of in the running industry, just all these roadblocks of like, well, do you really need to bring your baby? And I'm like, well, how's he gonna eat? Yeah, I have to bring my baby, you know? Um, it's interesting how like protecting him really helped me find my voice for myself. I don't know if I would have found out if I hadn't become a mother. There was something about him that made me care about other things. So at 34, I was starting to think bigger and broader. And obviously I had gone through the thing where I wasn't paid during my pregnancy and I was, I mean, I'm still angry about it, you know? So I was starting to think about, like, what do I want the sport to look like for the next generation? And that's really when I first started thinking about that. Which takes us to today and your future. You know, you, we know that you're a very successful elite runner, but your ultimate legacy, as you continue on, what do you want that to be? I want people to remember me as a good mom and a good wife. Um, that's what I really care about. And I guess a good sister. Um, <laughs> as far as the sport, I just want to keep protecting it. You know, we've talked about some rough times tonight, but really running gave me so much. Running gave me so much. I saw the world. I got to discover who I was. I learned what it was like to act, reach the highest level and learn what my limits were, which is scary, but also awesome. I, I owe so much to running, and so I know what it can be. And I just wanna make sure that other people get that opportunity. So whether it's like clean sport or it's abuse in sport, like those are the things that I care about the most at this point in my career. You know, I, I, I might get fired from NBC for some of the stuff I say and stand up for, and I love, love, love working for NBC, but I, I care more about protecting the sport and so that's kind of where I'm at in my life now is just doing everything I can to protect this generation, to make sure that they are in a safe 
environment where they get to face a level playing field. And maybe that's a pipe dream. Like maybe that's not even possible. But again, I can't, I, can't, I have to try. Do you want to give a shout out to your podcast? Oh, wait, which podcast? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> well, I was the co-host of the Clean Sport Collective podcast, but sadly, that's kind of on the back burner right now. People are very busy. People have lives. Um, but I did start a new podcast with Des Linden called Nobody Asked Us because nobody asked us to do it, but we really, really love it. And that's been really fun. Um, it's been super, I raced Des, I kind of hated racing Des because she's a really good marathon finisher. In 2016, during the Olympic trials, it came down the, to the two of us for the last third spot. And I was like, I'd rather be racing anybody else right now. Um, but I always respected her. And even through the Salazar stuff, when people were accusing me of doping, she would still be kind to me. She would still text message me. And so I always kind of liked her, but I didn't know her. And in 2020, I was at the Olympic trials marathon. And I had had this Wazelle event, and I'm kind of coming into the hotel. It's like midnight. And she's coming in from another Uber, and she goes, want to get a beer? And so we went and had a beer, closed out this place, and that kind of started this little friendship. And she was in Boulder last year, and, and we were like, we should just start a podcast. Like, we should just start one. If nobody listens, who cares? It's just an experiment. And we hit number one on sports in Apple Podcasts, like the only women in the top 50. And so we're, we're going to keep going. Good. Yeah, Good. We love that. Um, Kara, it's, it's just been such a pleasure to, to be up here with you tonight. And, um, you know, I think the Duluth community, I can speak on behalf of all of us here. It's, um, just so awesome to have you as a role model. And, um, I guess now is a good time to kind of open it up for, for questions from the audience. Only hard ones. <laughs> Hi, Kara. A little bit. Um, you know, I was just, I wanted to be good, and I was looking around. I knew I had already seen eating disorders at a younger age, and I had been like, really, I'm never going to do that. When I got into college, I was like, oh, man, I saw the girls, the women that were winning. I was like, I, I need to look like that. And I, I don't like that I did this, but I, at first I just set out to lose like a few pounds, but then every time I'd step on the scale, it would be kind of like a high that it would get lower and lower. And it was just so dumb and so short-sighted. But, um, you know, I didn't have a nutritionist. We didn't have that. Even when I was at the Organ Project, we didn't have that. I was able to sort of course correct because I had a boyfriend at the time who was like, eat a Dorito. And my mom, you know, was worried about me. Um, and so, it, but it wasn't like overnight. It took me about a year to get back to a healthy relationship with food. But again, I didn't have anyone like, telling me what to eat or anything. It was just sort of myself. And, and I paid for that. I paid for that year of restricting food. I was injured for like three years after that. I got stress fracture after stress fracture after stress fracture. And it was such a waste. It was such a waste. I could have had three more years of great running. I could have had, maybe I could have made a third Olympic team. And maybe I could have made it in 04 if I hadn't done that to myself. So I think it's it's really prevalent. And the thing I don't like about it is that we kind of sometimes shame people with eating disorders. And that's, that's crazy. We're being fed it all the time, all the time. And so I wish we could kind of remove that stigma and that shame and just be like, hey, a lot of us have had these things and it's totally normal. And how can we not be ashamed and talk about it and move forward together? Every woman I've ever trained with had some issue with food, every single one. And that's crazy. These are some of the most successful people on the planet. And I just wish we could have more open conversation because... I think people would realize like they don't have to be ashamed. Like it's not your fault that you went down this path. It's not your fault. And how can we work together to get out of it? Hi, Kira. Um, I have a question because in your book you mentioned uh, that you relied upon a lot with uh, Kelly and Kendall and your mother. How did they help you? Your family help you more than your teammates and your friends and. Uh, and your coaches, how did they get you through these times whereas the other, others could not? I think because they, 
never treated me like the runner. You know, I mean, I could come home and be around them and they still wanted to, like, they didn't want to be sad. They're like, hey, you're here. Let's hang out. Let's do this. Let's do that. They knew me before. That's why I think I'm really, really close with my high school friends still because, yeah, I met a lot of people after I won the medal and became famous in the running world, but they knew me long before that, right? So they're like a safe place for me. My family's always been that way. I knew they wanted me to succeed. I knew they wanted me to get all the dreams I had, but I also knew that whether I won an Olympic gold or never made it to the Olympics, it wasn't going to change how much they loved me. And they knew that I was more than that, you know? Like Charlotte said, I'm quirky, I'm funny, I'm so cool. <laughs> and they knew that, right? Like they know that side of me. And they always made me feel like I have more to offer than just whatever I did on the track or the roads. My sister's... Yeah. <laughs> I did run with that. Hi, Kara. I would just like to let everyone know that you were, in fact, cool in high school and that she's, she's lying. But also, my question no, is... No, you were cool. No, you were now cool. we're looking at a legit <laughs> athletic star right here in basketball. It's not, it's not true. It's so true, but okay. Um, my question is, um, with all of the major highs and the major lows that you went through, would you do it all over again? Totally. Totally. Um... I learned, I loved, even though there were so many rough times, I loved that life. I loved knowing I was getting everything I could get for myself. I, you know, in 2016, I, my family, we moved for me to try to make this third Olympic team. Everyone was sacrificing for me, and I didn't make it. I got fourth. And it was the mo one of the most heart, probably the most heartbreaking experience of my career. But I would still even do that again because I loved the training, I loved the commitment. I loved the people in my corner that believed I could do it. And I think I'm a better, stronger person because of everything I did. And I would, I would do it all again. I have no regrets. Well, I have one regret, which is returning to running so soon after having cold. But whatever. Other than that, I would do it again. Hi, Kara. Really hot up here. Sorry. <laughs> For um, those of us who are, I'm around your age. And do you have any advice for you know women in middle age who have been running as long as you have for longevity? Like, what do you recommend so that we can run as long as possible in our lives? I think. I mean, fueling is important. You're sitting next to a nutritionist right there. <laughs> See, I want to talk to her, um, but I do think as you get older, like protein becomes like way more important. Um, but I think it's just listening to your body. I I fought my body from 2016 to 2018, trying to be who I was in my 30s, trying to repeat the workouts. And when I finally was like, okay, I'm not. And when I turned 40, I was like, okay, well, there's a master's category for a reason because we like to still run, but we're not as fast, and that's fine. And all of a sudden, I stayed healthy. And so it was like if I just had, I feel like I could have had two more good years if I hadn't tried to fight who I was. I just needed more rest. I didn't eat as much, as much mileage as I had before. But, you know, like that mentality was like, no, 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 that's what I have to do. So I think it's giving yourself grace, meeting yourself where you're at. And also I think there's this weird thing we do where we're like, well, I'm not going to run a PR anymore, so I really shouldn't be leaving my family. I really shouldn't be not hanging out with them to go train or whatever. Like that's, it's really selfish. No, it's not. If it makes you happy, it doesn't matter. There's, there's importance in the journey of getting to a start line or, or continuing to run, no matter what the numbers look like or the time looks like. My, my day is still get my son to school, go run. Focus on me. At 11 o'clock, I'll do all the interviews, I'll do all the meetings, you know, ugh. but I have to run first. And I don't feel guilty about that because that's makes me feel good and it makes me feel who I am. And it's not for anything. I'm never going to make another team. I'm never going to start. I'm never going to stand on another start line. But it doesn't matter because I need it, you know. So I don't know. That was a really long way of saying keep running. <laughs> We've got some young girls in the audience. I'd love it if some of them had some questions too. Not the you aren't all young at heart. <laughs> kind of young. Well, I was, that's, you brought that up. I did also notice there are a lot of young girls in this audience, and I think your story is going to change their lives. Um, 
you're a big theme in this book is coaching, both in a positive way and in a negative way. And what would be your advice to those young girls in this audience that someday make a college choice or even high school and, and um, are evaluating coaches, are starting to build relationships with coaches? What is your advice to those girls, those young women, and what to look for and um, what, you know, what you valued, what you learned to value in those relationships? I, the thing is, like, your coach should never be your entire world. You know, if your coach makes you feel like you can't exist without them, even though that may feel like, to you, may feel like it's true, it's not. And um, your coach should meet you where you're at. And everybody's going to have good seasons, and everyone's going to have bad season. And a good coach is going to love you and support you just as much in those bad seasons as when you are being successful. And I think it's important to look at the team dynamic, too, you know, does, do people support each other? Or are they really just out for themselves? I think I was so lucky to have that experience at East where we really did care about each other. And it was very, very genuine and very, very real. I mean, I remember crying under the stands at East High School at something. And my teammates, Amy and Casey, going, we don't care if you win state or not. We just love you. We just want you to run. We just want you to run, you know? That matters. That's what keeps you in the sport. So there are a lot of really, really great coaches out there. But there are really a lot of bad coaches and if the other thing is if it feels wrong tell someone because we have intuition for a reason and I think we're kind of taught to put it away like oh no if there's a voice being like oh that makes me uncomfortable let it out tell someone you trust it's really Yeah, injuries are so hard. I think what I tried to do was I'd try to reframe it instead of it being like absolutely devastating, which it is. I think it's okay to like take a few days and, and realize you're not gonna have that season or the race you were prepping for or whatever. But then you need, like I always would try to reframe it. Hey, this is a time for me to go spend time with my family, to go out with my friends, things I don't normally get to do. And also I was like, I'm gonna make my body so strong and I'm going to work on my weaknesses in the weight room or the pool or whatever it is so that when I am able to start running again, I'm actually a better athlete. Like, I'm not going to willow away in this. I'm going to come back and I'm going to be better. And, you know, that, that got me through a lot of things. I mean, I had, like, literally 12 surgeries, no, 10 surgeries. I don't know. So, I mean, I had a lot of injuries. Um, so it doesn't mean injuries won't come back. But I also think the more that you come back from those injuries, you realize, okay, this is just a bump in the road. Careers are so long. And I think we can get really short-sighted about, oh, my whole life's over. But I think it's so always important to just reframe it. Hey, I have time I didn't know I was going to have. What am I going to do with it? And do some other things that you love that you normally can't do because you're training. Um, I'm Tule. Um, I'm a freshman at Duluth East, and I run on track and field and cross country and ice, Nordic ski. But um, what kind of mindset do you have for your races? Like when you race, what do you think about? I, I did struggle a lot with race anxiety throughout my career, um, worrying I was going to let people down, worrying I wasn't going to run that well. So I really worked on that. What the, one of the big things that helped me is I would just remind myself, hey, I'm just 
doing what I prepared to do. I'm not asking myself to do something I haven't done, right? Like you've done the training, you know about what you're ready to do. You're not asking yourself to do way better than that. You're asking yourself to do what you've proven to yourself in training you can do. The other thing I really liked to do was if I had a big goal, whether it was like the state meet or the conference meet or Boston Marathon, whatever it is, have a little journal and jot down something every day that I did right to achieve that goal. And then the night before, when it's inevitable you're going to get nervous, by the way. Butterflies just mean you care, right? That's all it means. It means like this cares. I put a lot of time into this. But when you start to feel those butterflies, then you can kind of go through that journal. And it, there's something about when it's not your husband or not your mom or not your coach, your own writing telling you that you are ready, that you did all of this training, you worked so hard, that it hits you a little bit more like, no, I am ready. And you can review that and remind yourself, I did all the work to be here. I don't have anything to be nervous about. So, but nerves are totally, totally normal. And remember, they're just there to tell you like you care. When I was younger, I felt like I had to be in the lead. Um, but as I got older, I realized, no, I'm just wasting energy if I'm in the lead. So I became more, I was very comfortable in a pack. I actually really liked to be in the pack. I would have a point in the race, whether it was on the track or in the marathon, where I knew I was going to have to wake up and do some work. Um, but I really enjoyed just being in the mix and just making sure, you know, you have to be a little bit more aware when you run in the pack that if a break happens, you have to be able to see it so you can move out and go with it. But it conserves so much energy. And there's, I think, there's like a confidence that comes from being able to say, I'm okay, I don't have to be ahead right now. I'm here right now. That's, I mean, all of my most successful track races, I just sat, 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 and then I was like, and now it's time. So I really liked being in the pack. And so much so that when I moved to the marathon, so in the track, you're bunched. And people elbow you, people step on you. You know, you have like blood on you after races, you get spiked. So I, I didn't care. I liked it. <laughs> so much so that when I went to the marathon, I would run. The first marathon I ever did, I was like right on Paula, tripping her over and over and over again. And she scolded me in the middle of the race, like, we have a whole road. What are you doing? You know? So it, I did have to take a little bit of a mind shift when I went to the marathon. Like, you don't have to be elbowing people. You know, you have a long way to go. But I loved being in the pack. Hot take. You felt like? <laughs> Look, I am a broadcaster. I know it's hard. And shout out to Carrie Tolson, another Minnesotan, the most accomplished Minnesotan high school record uh, runner of all time. And she was on that broadcast. But wow, it was painful. I was sitting there watching it. And I thought, don't. Don't say anything. Don't say anything. You know how hard it is to be a broadcaster. And then the third time that they use the split screen to go to Kipchoge instead of the women, I lost my mind. Oh, it was crazy. And see, those are the things where I'm like, we still have a long way to go. We invented the split screen so that we can still see the women. But now we're using the split screen to show the lead pack and the guy that we thought was going to win. And it was painful. And so I was very disappointed, and I, I let them know on social, because I can be a little bit snarky. Um, and again, that's not, that's not anything against Carrie. It's just, it's just another acknowledgement that we still have a ways to go to promote women's sport as equally as men, because we just we don't do it. We don't do it even on the broadcast some of the times that I'm a part of. But I let them know. Hi, Kara. Um, I think this is a good transition. Uh, I also read Des's book and Lauren's book. And yeah, everybody does care about women in sports. Um, do you have plans? Like, what are your plans? Do you want to be a coach? Are you planning to get together with Lauren and maybe figure out what we can do about eating disorders and make coaches um, be trained and make sure that if there are teams, they have a dietitian and they have an actual psychologist. Like, like there's, check not, these not boxes. Not a pseudo one? Yeah. Right. Like, you have to check these boxes for us to let you. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's pretty simple. Not that hard. I do think, you know, when I, when we found out that 
Allison Desir, Lauren Fleshman, myself, and Des would all be releasing books within, I think, a six-month time. I was like, oh, no. And my co-author was like, oh, what? She was like, no one would talk about four baseball memoirs coming out at once, you know? And, and I think that with three books on the New York Times bestseller list within two and a half months, we proved that people care about women's sports. Like, I think the NCAA basketball tournament this year, also, women's basketball tournament, also showed that, like, people care about women's sports. So I think that's really important. And then I think the thing with the success of our books is that it does allow us to get into rooms. It does allow us to get into conversations. And that's been one of the things that's happened for me is I've learned about these other women who are doing the work but just don't have the voice. So there are a lot of people doing a lot of good work and I just want to help amplify it. That's not my expertise. I don't know how to create safe space. I, I just know what's bad. Um, but I want to amplify the women that are doing that. And then as far as coaching, I would love to coach, but I think high school. Um, but at this point, I just couldn't because I'm so busy and I hate being busy. Um, but eventually, I think that would be a really fulfilling thing for me to do. And I've told Cole that if he runs in high school, I'm just going to force myself to be a, the assistant coach. <laughs> so maybe I'll coach boys first. I don't know. He literally just went, ugh. else so I'm not very deep when it comes to music I really like just happy poppy music like I listen to the top 40s in my car and it drives my husband nuts because he has like a subscription to Sirius radio where there are, are no commercials and I'm like I'll listen to 10 commercials just so I can hear Lady Gaga or whatever you know um, so I'm, this, this is a question that I get asked a lot. Like, I, it's not that deep. I mean, I would make playlists for every event that I was prepping for. So I literally still have on my phone, like, New York City Marathon 2014, Olympic Trials 2012, you know. Um, Duluth, when I ran the half marathon here. And it was, like, Pitbull. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel like we should meet. Oh, okay. Well, that was probably on there, too. But, yeah, I just really like happy songs that make me feel happy and you know like Taylor Swift just like happy happy stuff I mean not that Taylor's always happy but yeah I'm yeah I'm not very deep on the music scene anybody else fun question I can't believe Annie Siddick is here <laughs> this is wild I didn't do a ton, but I always did the life run, which I don't think that exists anymore. Does it run? Does it? No? Mother's, the Mother's Day run, does that still exist? No. Um, so I do like these little races. And it was just some, like, I always say I started running really young, but I didn't really start running and training until seventh grade, which is still very young. But I just really liked it. You know, my mom would enter me and I'd go. I remember at the Mother's Day run, they had like a short run for kids that were maybe nine and under, or 10 and under, and I always wanted to be the first girl. And I remember in fourth grade I was, and then in fifth grade, Kate Troy came with me and beat me. And I was like, I invited her. <laughs> and she beat me, darn it. But um, I just always would get nervous, but really liked pushing myself like that. And that's when I discovered that running was an organized event. I just like totally fell in love with it. No, it wasn't until I was older that I started looking up to athletes. My sister actually had, um, uh, I'm sure she still does or she did, a subscription to Sports Illustrated. And she, like, I wish you guys could see my closet in my bedroom when I was in high school because it's like Flojo, Jackie Joyner Kersey, Carl Lewis, nobody that I can run like. Like, nobody. And the first person that made my wall was Lynn Jennings that was actually a distance athlete. So I started, you know, I started to hear, and growing up here, I heard about Susie Favor, um, but yeah, I, you know, we didn't, I didn't have the internet and stuff, so literally it would be like my sister would read her thing and then like slide under my door, oh, here's a runner, you know, and I would put it up. I would put it up for sure. 
This might be kind of a strange question, but what advice would you give the men in the audience to better support their runners and their families? I don't know, because my husband is perfect. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I'm not, but really. Um, I just think uh, no, understanding that it's important. It's an important part of people's lives. And, and it's, it's, for me, it's like I don't meditate, but running is where I solve the world's worst problems. I come back. I, I am a better person when I run, whether I'm trying to compete or not. And so, you know, if someone needs to do a long run on the weekend, let them have that space. And remember, it's, I hate that people always say, running is a selfish endeavor. I hate that so much because when people watch football, no one says, well, that's a selfish endeavor, right? We all have our things that make us feel better, give us release. So I think just allowing people to have that time and knowing that it's important to them, so helping out with the kids or letting them go do that run, letting them go take that drive to that trail they want to do, and just supporting them along the way because it can be transformative. It has been in my life, and if anyone wants to do that, just supporting them to do so. And if you're... If you have a child, when, uh, people would say to me, oh, is Adam babysitting? And I'd be like, oh, you mean Adam's dadding? You know? So that kind of stuff is important, too, when you have kids helping out you know, and, and not making it seem like it's a favor that you're helping out so that they can go run. Not that I'm accusing you of that at all. Just saying. <laughs> That was, running the, the half here was the most memorable race of my life. Um, you know, I had accomplished all these things, but none of them were here, and I would come home and talk to people after, but, you know, like, they can't be in Beijing or Osaka or wherever, and so it was amazing. I was literally running through the streets, and people would be like, you were in my son's chemistry class. <laughs> And I would be like, oh, thanks, yeah. You know, it was, so, it was so fun. And to finish and have, you know, my grandparents were there. My high school coach was there. Obviously, my family was there. Um, it just felt like if I could run a race again, that's the race I would run. Um, it just was so special. And I thanked him last night, but I could, never, I could never thank him enough for Scott Keenan for seeing that. And he believed I could make that Olympic team, and he believed that he could get me to run in Duluth if he scored that national championship. And he did the bidding, and he got it done. And um, I'll just always be grateful for that memory. Speaking of coming back to Duluth, what is your guys' like, routine? Or do you like to do something every time you come back to Duluth or a favorite place to eat? Yeah, so I used to always want to go down to Canal Park because that's where my friends and I hung out, you know, like going to Dairy Queen and stuff. Um, uh, but I actually, my husband and I bought a home here a f three years ago, two years ago, three years ago. And so we've spent the last couple summers here, and I really, really love it. Um, just being here, not feeling like I have to do everything in one week. You know, our, our standards are Canal Park Brewery. We're there a lot. I like to go down by the lake. My son loves Lake Superior so much, so we spend a lot of time down there. Um, I mean, there's a bunch of things. We always go to Sir Ben's. We always go to the Portland Malt Shop. I always go to Bridgie's. So I got to get my milkshake there, too. Um, what? Oh, my mom loves Bob Benny. I do, too, but she really does, so it's become my thing because of her, basically. But <laughs> I just really like being down by Lake Superior. We have a house on a small lake, and I love that life, and I love waking up by the water. And But I always... I like to come down here a lot. We come to Fickers a lot. Basically, yeah, we're fans. We're super fans of downtown Duluth. Is that Niels Arvold? Oh my gosh, in the Arvolds. This is like wild. I see Barb Hill. This is crazy. Okay. Thanks for coming. Um, I was diagnosed with, with dystonia um, first in November of 21, and then I went to the Mayo Clinic in February of 22, and it was confirmed. So essentially, I was diagnosed with repetitive movement dystonia. So when you go to do a movement, you've done a lot. 
the somehow the brain wires get crossed and your muscles all flex at once, all fire at once. And so I lost control of like my left leg basically from the knee down. So at first I was told I can't run anymore. Um, but my doctor in Colorado, my neurologist, my neurologist in Colorado was like, you used to run 135 miles a week. Like he doesn't understand that you're not like a 20 mile a week person or something. So she really helped me. She put me on some medication, a Parkinson's medication, which helped a lot. And then she helped me get in to see someone who gives me Botox. Um, and so I've been doing that and I'm, I've had a lot of ups and downs. I've had months where I feel really great and months where I don't feel great. Um, and, but I've been pushing forward and I've also started to see a, a neuro, neurological PT, which I didn't even know was a thing. And then I also see someone at least once, but usually twice a week to just work on my overall body because the Botox is kind of a Band-Aid and it's making my left leg a little bit weaker and like my hip is having to take some impact. So it's been a very frustrating thing for me. I have to tell you, when I was diagnosed with it, I was, I was angry. I was like, this is the one thing in my life that I like. And now you're telling me I can't do it. So it's been very frustrating, but also I have a team of people who like really believe that I can sustain some level of running. And that's where I'm at right now, about 40 miles a week and I'll take it, but I would always like more. that everybody's journey is different and everybody's journey matters and that the, the way to truly enjoy this ex experience is to be dedicated to each other and to care about each other. I think there's so much pressure to always get better and always PR and that's not really sustainable long term. That's, a, that's not sustainable if you wanna love the sport for the rest of your life. So just building that community, realizing that they have something special and um, that everybody's journey is unique and everybody's journey is just as important. Well, Kara, thank you. Thank you. And Sharla and Brett, thank you both for moderating. Um, I know you were a little nervous about it, but <laughs> you both did great. So thank you so, so much. And Kara, thank you again for picking figures and for reaching out to us. Um, Kara is going to sign. We're going to move the signing into the August Fitger room, and um, my volunteers slash room hosts slash booksellers slash jack of all trades, jacks of all trades, because there's several of them, um, said they got stuff figured out for the best way for flow. So we'll let Kara go, go over there first, and then um, we'll just get people in line. Kara has assured us she's going to stick around. Um, and sign until people are, are done signing. Fitgers isn't going to kick us out. Um, so we don't have to worry about being on some sort of time schedule. Um, but again, please, if you, we do still have books for sale in the hallway. So if you thought during the talk, hey, I really need to buy this for this person or this person, um, please do that. We'll be able to sell those. Um, but thank you all for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for supporting Fitgers and local businesses. And uh, I hope we have a great, great uh, summer. I think we're, I think Duluth is actually going to get a summer. So now that the snow you is You deserve gone. it. Yeah. 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 Thank so, you so much for coming. I you. really appreciate it. Thank you.